Uh, today, I want to start with uh, some information that's drawn from a recent uh, United States Census Bureau report. And it says this, between now and 2050, the United States will experience considerable growth in its older population. In 2050, the population, the population that is between, uh, that is age 65 and over, is projected to be almost 85 million people within the United States. So 85 million people, which is roughly twice as many people in that category as exist today. And so we're going to have a growing, uh, larger senior population. The baby boomers are largely responsible for this increase in older population. And uh, I'm a part of uh, that generation, though idealistically I'm... I like to call myself a cusper because I'm actually pretty close to the Gen X because I'm on the end of the baby boomers, so, and I'm such a modern, uh, up-to-date kind of guy. So we like to define ourselves very well. And uh, the boomers began turning 65 in 2011. That means the first, first wave of the boomers turning 70 this year. The aging of the population will have wide-ranging implications for our country Uh, for all of us. Now, by aging, what the demographers mean is the proportion of the population in the older ages is increasing. So, the projected growth of the older population is going to present plenty plenty of challenges. There are going to be policy implications for that, program implications, things like Social Security and Medicare are going to be stretched to the limits. It's also going to affect families, businesses, health care providers. So, here's, here's... Here's my thing in in the middle of this. And we're we're talking in family matters about a lot of different topics related to family. So we're talking to uh, the process of aging. Here's my question. Because, see, I'm interested in eternal things. What impact will this generation have on God's kingdom work? And I'm talking about the population now and this growing population in the next couple of decades. Now, realize impact for God when you're older starts when you're a whole lot younger and that's one of the things you're going to find in Psalm 71 is that this guy he's not saying well now that I'm an older person I'm going to be really spiritual he's been working on this for a long time there's there's a cumulative factor when it comes to your legacy and the mark you're going to leave on the world and you build this spiritual resume you start early you got a lot of room to build a spiritual resume with tremendous kingdom of God impact in your later years. Now, what we want to focus on today is how do you live well when you're you're probably going to live long? And I know that I talk about something like this, and even those of you who are well along in your journey, as we say, you're saying, I wonder who he's talking to. Because it must be somebody else. It couldn't be me. Surely I am not a part of this category of humanoid. So I want to give you some measures of what it means to get older. Because sometimes we are in denial about where we are. And uh, I had a conversation with my sister yesterday who found out from my mother that I had shingles. She lives in South Carolina. And I hadn't thought to tell her I had shingles and came up pretty quick, uh, you know, old man diseases. Uh, she's a very compassionate soul. So, <laughs> you, you know you're getting old when? You know you're getting older when? When everything hurts. And what does not hurt does not work. <laughs> when, that, when that gleam in your eyes is just the sun reflecting off of your bifocals. When, uh, like, uh, I woke up this morning, when, when you wake up in the morning and you feel like the morning after, but you haven't been anywhere. Uh, when your little black book only contains, contains names that end with the letters MD. When you're, you look at your children and your children look middle-aged. When, I've had this problem multiple times, when your mind starts making contracts that your body cannot keep cannot meet. Uh, you will look forward to a dull evening. Uh, when as a couple, you turn out the lights 
for economic reasons rather than romantic reasons. When you, you love sitting in your rocking chair, but you do not have the ability to make it move. Uh, when, <laughs> I feel this sometimes, when, when your knees begin to buckle, but your belt will not. Uh, <laughs> Uh, this, this is for you guys out there. When you're 17 around the neck, 42 around the waist, and about 106 around the golf course, uh, your back goes out more often than you do. Uh, the fortune teller offers to read the lines on your face. It's one of my favorites. The, the little old gray-haired lady you help across the street is your wife. Uh, you, you sink your teeth into a steak, and your teeth stay in the steak. <laughs> uh, when you said, I need to remodel the house because we need more room, but you don't need more room for more family members. You don't need more, more bedrooms. You, you, need, you need to greatly expand the scope of your medicine cabinet. And when you, you think you pretty well know all the answers, but nobody's asking you the questions anymore. Uh, talking about aging, this is one of my favorite uh, descriptions of aging and what it looks like. Uh, a comedian d did this uh, years ago, and I've kept it for a long time. I've shared it oh, several, several years ago, a couple different uh, venues here. But here's what it says. Do you realize that the only time in our lives when we like to get old is when we're, when we're kids? If you're less than 10 years old, you're excited about aging, and you start thinking in fractions. How old are you? You, know, you say, I'm, I'm four and a half. You, know, you never say, I'm 36 and a half. No, but you are four and a half. You're four and a half, and you're going on five. And that's a key. You get into your teens, and now they just can't hold you back. You jump to the next number, even if it's way far ahead. You, you say, how old are you? I'm going to be 16. Well, you, you could be 13. But you are going to be 16, so you go ahead and lay the marker out. Then the greatest day of your life, you become you become 21, and even the words sound like a ceremony. You become 21. You become 21, oh sure, but then you turn 30. That's almost always the phrasing, you turn 30. Like, ooh, what happened? It makes you think uh, of uh, milk that's gone bad. He, he turned we had to throw him out. Uh, there's no fun now. You just soured. What's wrong? What's changed? You become 21. You turn 30. And then, and then the, next, the next decade, what are you? You're pushing 40. I'm pushing 40. Like, please, someone tap the brake. Someone slow this down. And yet, I'm careening out of control. And it's all slipping away. And before you know it, you reach 50. As if, uh, well, I reached 50. It's all over now. Fun's done. Dream's gone. But wait, you, you make it to 60. God, I made it to 60. You didn't think you would. Most of your family didn't think you would, but you did. You make it to 60. But see, you've built up so much speed at this point, you just hit 70. I, and, and that's the phrase. That most, I hit 70. Like you just ran into a wall. After that, it's just a day-to-day -day thing. You hit Wednesday. <laughs> you get into your 80s, and it's like you're batting for the cycle every day. Uh, you, you hit lunch. You turn 4.30. You reach bedtime. It doesn't end there, though. Into your 90s, it starts getting a little better because you start going backwards. And, uh, and then you make it over 100, and you come like a little kid again. I'm a hundred and a half. There you go. All right. Today, much of this message is for those of, uh, of us who've gotten older. And I think most of us are getting older. But I want to tell you, so, again, so much of our influence when we are older is constructed on our way to older. Do you get that? So much of what our influence, our impact for, for God's kingdom within your family, it's constructed on your way to being older. You're building a spiritual resume every day. And if you're going to finish well, what you do as a teenager, what you do as a college student, what you do as a young adult, has tremendous impact on where you're going to finish this race of life.
I want to share a great biblical example. And, and I've already read uh, no, most of the first half of Psalm 71. I want to pick up in verse 17 of Psalm 71. Here the psalmist says, and this is an older man writing about life, life that is, at the time he is older, difficult, with multiple challenges. But he looks back, he looks around, he looks forward. Oh God, from my youth you have taught me, and I still proclaim your wondrous deeds. And so even to old age and gray hairs, oh God, do not forsake me. Until I proclaim your might to another generation, your power to those to come. Your righteousness, O God, reaches the high heavens. You have done great things, O God, who is like you. You have made me see many troubles and calamities. You who have made me see many troubles and calamities will revive me again from the depths of the earth. And you'll bring me up again. You will increase my greatness and comfort me again. I will also praise you with the harp for your, your faithfulness, O oh my God. I will sing praises to you with the lyre, O oh Holy One of Israel. My lips will shout for joy when I sing praises to you, my soul also, which you have redeemed. My tongue will talk of your righteousness, your righteous help all the day long. For they have been put to shame and disappointed who sought to do me hurt. The psalmist here isn't named. Some people still think it was probably David because it's in the middle of uh, a lot of psalms that are uh, written by David. But the psalmist isn't named. What we have is an older believer looking back. Here's how God's been faithful. Here's how God's worked in my life. Looking forward, trusting God for what is yet ahead and seeking to live well in the today regardless whatever a day may hold for him. That's a pretty good model for us. So here's this older guy with lots of trials and problems, but he's, he's obviously a joyful man who's able to put his focus on the Lord in the midst of all these trials. And, and the psalm shows us the way to, to grow old and do it well is to develop a walk with God right now. Wherever you are in the journey right now, you start digging in deep to develop a walk with Him that is meaningful, that, that is full now. And uh, it makes growing old uh, much more meaningful and purposeful. The reason the psalmist could handle the problem so well as an older man is he developed a walk with God in the years leading up to this. So he has this proven resource in God that enabled him to take on whatever was going to happen. Does, and, and really, his life is not easy. He's not coasting in, uh, sitting with his feet propped up, saying, look how wonderful life is now because I've been faithful to God. He's still in the fight. And and the many challenges that come our way as we get older. He's taking those things on with great confidence because his confidence is in the Lord. So here's some things that we need to know on that journey. And I've just picked out five things from, uh, from this chapter. Here's the first one. If, you, if you're going to grow old and you're going to do it well so that you can expand your influence, your, your kingdom of God impact, we need to know God. Isn't that clear enough? The first couple of words in my translation, in you, Lord, do I take refuge, in you. It reminds me of how Paul talked about a relationship to God. He, his favorite way to talk about it, you remember, is in Christ. Not, and this is how we often approach this, we say, well, it's Christ. I want to ask Jesus into my heart. I'm going to give him a little spot over here in the corner where he's not going to disrupt things too much in my plan. No, that, that's, not, that's not how this plays. Instead, it is in Christ, in, in the Lord, that we are enveloped by Him. He is master over all. We're a part of His great plan. He's not just a part of our great plans. So that's a relationship to God. And this psalm, I look for a word for a long time to describe this, it radiates with this deep personal understanding, practical knowledge of the Lord God. So he had been taught of God in verse 17 from his youth again he's finishing well because he invested well on the front end he had been taught of God from his youth now, how do you live well with God for a long time you get an early start how about that don't say this very clearly don't waste early years on lesser things and that's true for you and it's true for your children and your grandchildren uh I know so many people in their walk with God, 
that there's this big gaping hole in the journey. Hey, did pretty good here, did pretty good here, but I've got a decade in my 20s, a decade in my 40s or 50s that are just lost to God and the things of God. And you have those kind of deficits in your journey, it's going to come back to bite you. Uh, You can't take time off. You know, a lot of people, there's so many things for our kids to be involved in, but you give up their elementary school and middle school years to lesser things, and you take a decade out of your children's life, and then you say, okay, well, now we're going to plug them back in as high schoolers? I, I, just, I just tell you, don't blame Chris Jones and our youth ministry or our church that a high schooler isn't connected to the God and the things of God when you circle back around there. And you took a decade out of their lives with God. That's true for all of us. And I know a lot of people just take a big chunk of time away and, and, and it shows up in, in the difficulties of the journey. Uh, they don't have the resources to take them on. Look for the key words here that describe God. Not, he's not a second-hand God. He's a God of relationship. And the, in, in highlighting this chapter, there are lots of places where I just have words, one word highlighted, it, des- describing God. He's a refuge, a deliverer, a rock, a fortress, a hope. He is righteous. He is faithful. And, and this guy's just getting started when he, he blows through all that, the first few verses, as he describes his personal knowledge, his personal experience with God. One scholar writing about God's righteousness, which God's righteousness, you look at, anytime you're looking at a, at a section of Scripture, you look at words that are repeated because that means they're probably a big deal to the writer. Five times in this chapter, the word righteousness shows up. And uh, this one scholar, he just said, righteousness in this psalm is God's faithfulness to keep his promises to his people. Righteousness is God's faithfulness to keep his promises to his people. God is righteous. This guy knew his God, and it was obvious that he had known him for years, and he had proved it out. Not, not, in, uh, not in the classroom, in practical application. He had proved God's faithfulness on a number of previous difficult situations. And that's why when he looked forward to the future and the clouds on his horizon he wasn't afraid so in this instance he needs to trust God and it's not a matter of and I know so many people that in that moment of crisis then you start calling God if you exist God if you're out there God if you're listening he doesn't have that kind of relationship to God instead he's not taking a blind leap of faith to say God I need you because he knew his God and he knew him in a personal and a practical in a proven kind of way. Uh, Now, here's what I want to ask you. Do you know God like that? Not, not, I I can throw out a principle like that from Scripture, and you go, oh yeah, that's the way someone should do this. I'm not caring about someone. I'm asking about you. Do you know God in this kind of way, where it is so close to you, so real to you, it's not a make-believe God, it's not a God far off in heaven. You have worked to develop a walk with God in the years leading up to this day. And if not, today's a good day to get started with this. He, w- he had a proven resource in the Lord. It enabled him to, to be strong, even when life was hard. Now, how do you do this? How do you do... Well, uh, I, uh, let's see. The last Sunday of June, I'm going to preach a sermon on the Bible. We're going to do a doctrinal series, focusing on core doctrines of Scripture this summer. And one of those is the doctrine of the authority of the Bible. And, and one of the things that we believe at our church is when the Bible speaks, God speaks. That the Bible is the Word of God to us. And so we hold on to that. We believe that. That's the foundation for what we do. And... Uh, I posted this, the full study to my blog this last week. Pew Research Center came up with a survey about what's important to people who self-identify as Christians. And uh, they asked, how important are these things? So people who said, I'm a Christian, I'm a follower of Jesus Christ, I belong to Jesus. 42% of them said, reading the Bible is important. of people who claim to be Christians said reading the Bible is important. I don't think they're all Christians. I don't think that word means what they think it means. How about that? Uh, That is tragic. The way 
the way you get to understand who God is, is you're gonna ha- that will prepare you for whatever crisis you face in the future, is you spend time in God's Word right now. And you want to spend a lot of time in God's Word. You want to know Him well as He has, a, as he has expressed Himself to us, as He has made Himself known to us. So getting to know God comes through godly habits like like Bible study and like prayer and like being together with God's people. The psalmist uses the word continually in verses 3, verse 6, verse 14. Continually. This is not a from time to time expression of his faith. This is the ongoing pattern of his life. So every day, he is all in getting to know his God. You do do not accidentally have a great relationship to God. Now, I know some great mature believers, and they just didn't wake up one day and say, well, now I'm all mature and all full up with knowledge of God. They have been investing over time to develop that kind of relationship to God. So this guy, he had a relationship to God that carried him through a lifetime. And if you're going to have that kind of relationship, you're going to have to work at it. You're going to have to lean into it. You're going to have to practice it. Habits. Second thing is you need to trust God. The whole psalm is just this affirmation. The psalmist says, I trust God. I I believe that what God says is true. Uh, Charles Spurgeon wrote a book called The Treasury of David, and it's a commentary on the psalms. And He says, Psalm 71 is the utterance of a struggling but unstaggering faith. Unstaggering faith. He was struggling because of difficult circumstances. People were seeking to take his life, but he was firm in his faith because he knew my faith is invested well. I have put my faith not in me, not in my world, not in my circumstances, not in my country. I have put my faith in my Lord. Paul was writing about, and Paul's a guy, an apostle Paul, who faced plenty of struggles, but he has this great word of hope. He said, that's why I am suffering here in prison, but... I'm not ashamed of it, for I know the one in whom I trust, and I am sure that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him until the day of his return. So the psalmist, he developed this habit of trusting God in the difficult times of life. Have you, are you frequently filled with with worry, with fear, with doubt and if those things begin to characterize your day then that's a trust problem with God and you need to get to know God better you need to spend more time with him if 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 you're if you're feeling that uh, in relationship to your own life or relationship to the nation or the world worry doubt and fear do not characterize the people of God We've been set free from those things through Jesus Christ who defeated even sin and death. Review what God has already done for you. Build it, rebuild a foundation maybe. Okay, here's the list of all the things God's already done for me. Be reminded of God's faithfulness in the past and it will grow your trust and faith in Him in the day. Third thing is we need to worship God. And In verse 6, one of the habits of his life, he continually worshiped God. Continually is one of the words tied to his worship. He's just always wanting to express his love for God. And worship is, is, not, uh, is not following an order of worship. And then I have now worshiped God. Worship is your love for God, your heart for God being expressed. Most of us, you know, our default mode, our default mode as, especially as American Christians and just Americans, we are complainers and we are grumblers by our sinful nature. But God wants a people who worship Him, who love Him, even when it is hard. And difficult times have come and will continue to come to our lives at all kinds of levels. God wants us to learn to praise Him, to to love Him. The psalmist had deliberately developed this habit of showing his love for God. We find it in verse 8, verse 14, verse 22 through 24. He describes his worship, his expressed love for God. Now, we already talked about this some, but sometimes you worship God for who He is. And sometimes you worship God for what He has done. But it helps you either way to trust God 
for more uh, that is yet to come. The uh, writer of Hebrews, and let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. We worship better together. And when we start, we say, well, I have so many things going or I'm so discouraged. Sometimes people get discouraged and the first thing they do is they say, and I'm mad at God about it and I'm going to run away from God. I'm going to stay away from God's people. And the darkness is going to get darker and the, the depths of difficulty are going to feel deeper. We come together to worship because... Because God has commanded it, and I have, feel, well, I don't have to be in church to worship God. Absolutely not. I did, a, I did a lot of worship this morning. I did a little worship yesterday, and I wasn't gathered together with a bunch of other people. But the reason those this morning, early, and yesterday were meaningful to me is because I have been in the habit of not neglecting gathering together with other believers, as the writer of Hebrews said, some are in the habit of doing. It enriches and informs, and... Uh, it's never going to work right until you get together with other believers. Here's a fourth thing. We need to place our hope in God. We're going to, we're going to live, live long and live long well. We need to place our hope in God. Verse 14 begins, I will hope continually. Verse 17 and verse 18 are a great bracket to that thought. I will hope in God from my youth to my old age and gray hairs and everything in between. I will hope in God. And then he says, but I'm not going to say this is all about me because I'm going to pass this on to the next generation. Everybody needs to know this. We need to understand that there's a big difference. The word hope is thrown around freely uh, and badly in so many different environments. Uh, there's a difference between secular hope and biblical hope. And the difference is in the object of the hope. You know, secular hope is uh, based on things that are not sure and Biblical hope is based on God, who is absolutely sure. Uh, when I say I have a, I have an investment in the stock market, and I hope that I, I get a ten percent return on my investment this year, well, my hope is based on an object that is unsure. I'm not sure what the stock market may do this year. But when I say I, I have hope. Jesus Christ, who came to this earth as Savior, that he is coming again for his church. My hope is guaranteed. It's already settled because it's not the object of my hope is my Savior. And he is absolutely sure. It's just not yet realized. So it's, it's an anticipation, not yet realized. It's built on trust in God and his faithfulness. Uh, one of my favorite People from Christian history, Adoniram Judson, you know, read a good biography of this great missionary pioneer. He, he, he went into places as the first person to step in to share the gospel with, with, with people groups. And at one point in his life, he was suffering from a fever, anticipating death uh, in a miserable prison situation in Burma. It was a difficult, difficult time. He was able to receive some correspondence from uh, supporters and prayer partners. And a friend sent him a letter that said, Judson, in prison, terrible fever. Judson, how's the outlook? And he responded back, and this was his response to that question. The outlook is as bright as the promises of God. Now, too many people have picked up this negative, hopeless world. And, and our, all our focus is on the problems instead of on God. It's like Peter in the, in the boat. Jesus says, okay, come on out. Peter starts walking on the water. But remember what happens. He, looks, he takes his eyes off Jesus, starts looking at the waves, and he begins to sink. And for a lot of Christians, we know Jesus is out there. And yet, we take our eyes off him. We look too much at the problems, and we begin to feel our hopes are, are disappearing Listen, that'll make you bitter instead of better. And I know a lot of people at all kinds of stages. I know teenagers are just terribly bitter because their eyes are on everything except Jesus. I know, I know senior, senior adults who have taken their eyes off of Jesus and everything seems so bad and they're angry and bitter. God's people should be a people who hope in God. So the psalmist, 
he's in a good way in his old age because he has this deep knowledge of God and he had developed these godly habits. He's going to trust, he's going to worship, he's going to hope in all things God. And then if you're going to live this life, you're going to run this race, you're going to walk in a relationship to God, then shouldn't you finish well with an eye on the goal? Uh, that verse 9, do not cast me off in the time of old age. This guy says, uh, don't put me on the sidelines just because I'm an older guy. I I'm not planning to retire because of my age. He's going to finish strong. And he still had this concern for ministry, and he still had a concern for worship, and he still had a concern for testifying to others who didn't know him, didn't know the Lord, of the glory, the faithfulness, the power of God. And verses like verse 8, verse 15 through 18, verse 24, point in those directions. As long as he had breath, he was going to keep telling people about the greatness and the glory of his God. It's like the Apostle Paul, late in life, one thing I do, forgetting what is, lies behind and straining forward to what is ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Now, I want you to hear this. There is not a biblical concept of retirement from serving God. In fact, the Bible gives example after example after example of people that late in life, they are still leaning into the finish line. And, and what a blessing th those people can be because they've developed a spiritual resume that has much greater impact uh, for kingdom of God purpose. And God didn't build all those things into you over years for you to shelve them later in life. You have a voice, and that voice means something. And listen... The kingdom of God needs you. Your church needs you. Now, I'm going to run through some things here. And by the way, when I talk about retiring from serving God, a lot of people do that around their 40s. Hey, I, I really went all in during my 20s and 30s and my children were young, but now I'm done. But, but beyond that, we need to use this voice that God has given us. You need to serve. We need you. And here's some practical ways where you can do that. Wherever you decided, well, I'm done. How about this? We need, for vacation Bible school, around 18 teachers still in the grade school level. Here's what I want you to hear about that. Most of those teachers, because of how enrollment's coming in, most of those teachers that we need right now are in the third and fourth grade range. They have completed third grade and completed fourth grade. That is the hotbed of evangelism in vacation Bible school. That's where children are making decisions for Christ that are eternal decisions. And that's a spot where we need some folks who know Jesus well, and who are passionate about the gospel because you've experienced the passion of the gospel. We need people that say, I could serve there. We're not going to throw you in there uh, without any help, uh, all by yourselves. You don't have to roll on the floor with them, but you sure could tell them about Jesus. And you could model a relationship to Jesus. We need you there. And I'm telling you what, 18 people, we ought to get that out of this service. And if we don't, oh, pity the second service, what they get from me. There's a desk back here, and we need adults who would step back there and say, I'm taking a spot in vacation Bible school. And especially, strategic, this is a strategic, we need A-listers here who are going to be in classes where they're going to be sharing the gospel with children. We need six teachers in preschool. And uh, again, you're not in there by yourself. There's a lot you can do. And uh, just have someone that's more of a grandparent age to so those children uh, be a blessing to them. Uh, each day, we're going to be reaching out to unreached families. In the past, we've often waited till the end of the week. And then we said, okay, now we're going to do a sweep and try to capture all these families who on, they have identified on their own registration card. We don't have a church anywhere. And so we're going to do this on a daily basis. And Ross Ramsey is your contact on this. But each day, just to go, to go to the homes of these kids, go to their home, knock on the door and say, hey, First Baptist Church, we're so glad you shared your children with us. Anything we can, we want to have a gift for you, anything we can pray for you. And you're, you're not going to take three hours at their house. You don't have to go through a big gospel presentation. But a quick first touch and some love from First Baptist Church Allen. And we have a lot of you that say, yeah, I could, me and a friend or two, we could jump into a car and we could do that. Uh, they've already expressed an interest in our church. You're not cold calling. Uh, they came to us. 
uh, a prayer team. We're going to emphasize this heavily next week. But just as a uh, foretaste of that, if every person in this church, 9 o'clock is when we're kicking off Vacation Bible School, what if everybody in, every one of us, wherever you are in the world at 9 o'clock, each day of Vacation Bible School, you spend some time and said, God, I pray for this day. We have some great prayer guides, just simple things to remember, a part of each day. But the power of prayer is so very important. Uh, here's something else, completely different somethings. The next two. You know, we need uh, Link volunteers. You know, Link is the first hour, we're doing Sunday school with our preschoolers. The second hour, uh, we also have a teaching time, but it's less structured. It's a different kind of environment. Here's, here's what we need. Parents of preschoolers, they're on a rotation where if you have a school, preschoolers down there, you're going to go through a rotation periodically or a few weeks. You're going to serve down in Link. But we need a lot of people that maybe pre, you haven't had a preschooler in a long time. But if you would step into that, and we have a lot of you who do this. I'm so grateful for you. But what if we had a bunch more of you who said, you know, every six, eight weeks, uh, I don't have preschoolers, but I could go down there and I could, I could help out at that second hour of preschool. You would enable the parents of a preschooler to be in their class where God has maximum opportunity to, to touch their marriage, to touch their hearts for Jesus, to make a difference in them for eternity. And if we can get in that kind of rotation, we have done something really big. And some of you, you can do this and we need you. Okay, now this one, well, here's your one. So I got, uh, we, we have a partnership with uh, a lot of ministry going on in Guatemala. And uh, a lot of you have been a part of some Guatemala things with us. Well, we got a request recently uh, in the last month. I talked about this on a Wednesday night, uh, just threw it out as a, a quick something. But I want to throw this out in a big way, and I'm your contact for this one. Our partners in Guatemala said, the public schools are open to the gospel once we get our foot in the door. And here's, here's the request. They said, we need grandparent age folks to come to Guatemala to help uh, very simply to open the door to get us into the schools on a weekly basis sharing the gospel. And so we need some grandparent folks to do that. And uh, it, it's, a different, it's a different approach. They're not, in Guatemala, they see mission teams in different places. They do not see, uh, they do not see older people in those situations. And there's a lot of you that health-wise, you could do this. Guatemala's a beautiful place, a safe place. And if you do this, I will, I will go with you uh, to Guatemala. It's one of my favorite countries in the world to serve the Lord. And God is doing such incredible things. But we need, we need senior adults to do it. And uh, I'm your contact for that one. Well, let's see what God might be up to in us. But I'll tell you this part. He's not done. Now, one last thing. So I do a lot of reading, and I came across this piece by John Piper. I don't agree with everything John Piper says, but this is pretty good. He wrote this uh, article on the occasion of his 70th birthday. He's one of those, uh, the first wave of uh, baby boomers hitting 65, hitting 70. And this is what he wrote. At 70, I am energized to dream great things. Because, and here's what he says, because this year... Hillary turned 69, Bernie turned 75, and Donald turned 70. And he said, my energy, my rising energy has nothing to do with their policies or their character. It has to do with the incredible fact that all of them want to spend their 70s doing the hardest job in the world. What a great, that's a great thought. So if Hillary, Bernie, and Donald want to bear the weight of the world for the next four to eight years out of man-centered, philanthropic motives, I find my 70-something zeal for Jesus heating up. They only get to be president of a tiny territory called the USA. I get to be an ambassador for the sovereign of the universe. They only get to change the way people live for the next few decades through policies and appointments and the like. I get to change the way people will live forever with a good deal of spillover for this world in the process. He said, this article isn't mainly about me. It's about the 70 million baby boomers coming behind me. I'm the oldest, born in 1946, the youngest, born in 1964. 10,000 Americans turn 70 every day. 
and they'll continue to do so for about the next 19 years. Billions of dollars are spent every year trying to get us to waste the last chapter of our lives on leisure. And he just says, to all of you aging adults, don't waste it. Peter wrote, to the elders among you, I appeal as a fellow elder, a witness of Christ's sufferings, and one who also will share in the glory to be revealed. Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care. Serving as overseers, not because you must, but because you're willing, as God wants you to be. This, I would say, to those of us getting older, don't retire from serving God. Peter says, stay in the game in that verse from chapter 5, 1 Peter. You're needed more now than ever. And it may not feel like it at times. and You may feel like no one's listening, but your family needs you more now than they've ever needed you. Uh, whether they realize it or not. Your church needs you desperately. And the kingdom of God needs you to step up as never before. Because there's a lot of us. And there's going to be a lot more of us in the, as a percentage of the population. And, and God knew it was going to work that way. And a lot of eternal things hang in the balance. And I just want to challenge you. You give your best for God in this stage of the run. Let's stand and let's pray.